the layers in your story are just <laughs> building wild. <laughs> yes. When you put it that way, yes. <laughs> that is insane and massively yeah. impressive. Oh, thank you. You're very kind. Welcome to the Next Level American Dream podcast. This episode is brought to you by Thompson Multifamily Group. Are you ready to start taking your American dream to the next level through passive investing? The hosts, Sean and Abigail, are a father-daughter duo trying to accomplish their goal of financial freedom through multifamily real estate. While you're here, please comment, rate, review, like, or subscribe to help us grow. What does the American dream mean to you? And how are you taking it to the next level? Here's another episode of Next Level American Dream. Hello, Deepa. How are you? Hey, Welcome to Next Level American Dream. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here with you. I'm so excited to have you. We met at the Best Ever Conference, what was it, a few weeks ago, and I absolutely fell in love with your introduction into real estate uh, and wanted to bring you on and have you share your story. So I would love to start at the beginning. Can you tell me where you're from? Sure, sure. Yes, I was born in India. That's fantastic. So I grew up in India and got all my, until my bachelor's, I got a mechanical uh, engineering degree and that was in India. And I really wanted to do some research and get an advanced degree and okay. came here for, to get my master's in mechanical and aerospace engineering to University of Missouri, Columbia. Well, and that is what you ended up doing was, so your specialty was in mechanical engineering, like you said, what did you end up going on into as your career progressed after you got your education? So, okay. That's a bit of a story. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I graduated when the great recession hit as it was starting in 2007. Also, I was kind of blindsided by not knowing that Boeing was not hiring foreign-born engineers who did not have a green card, especially, or I guess only in the facilities where they had defense contracts okay. after 9-11. And most of my research, well, actually all of my research was for Boeing. And okay. Boeing actually sponsored my master's degree. So, you know, I never had a doubt that I was not gonna work for Boeing. I thought I had it all figured out. Right. Um, so my research was doing friction stir welding and on different materials of different alloys of aluminum and trying to reduce the heat affected zone. And this was all for Boeing for, for the, the skin of the aircraft and for the structural parts in the aircraft. And we were trying to weld two different alloys too, see how they both do together. So yeah, I was, I was, all my work was for Boeing and Boeing used my research too. And I found out I couldn't work for them. And in 2007, you know, there were no, there were not many jobs. Yeah. What a time to experience this. Right. It was a downturn and me being first generation immigrant, uh, I literally had no family here. I did not know anyone in the country. Right. So for me, I just had to take any job that comes my way or not use what I have learned here and go back to India and, and try and get another degree or just start from scratch or at least where I left off yeah. uh, back in India. So fortunately, I got offer through my professor. Another alumni was an entrepreneur and he had a company and they were manufacturing monopoles, which are these big steel structures that carry electricity and my professor he knew he knew my situation he goes hey this might really not fit what you did for your master's but you know do you want to just do this i go yes, yes. like anything i i yes yeah <laughs> I like, give it a try why not right what i didn't realize that it was in civil engineering and i had i didn't have a clue about civil engineering so this job was all about civil engineering and all about designing things that don't move meaning right. you know bridges anything that civil engineers do, we prefer not, them not to move. 
and I was trained in automobile engineering and, you know, just different things, designing gears and, and levers and how to make things move. So right. that was, that was an interesting shift for me. Yeah, no kidding. Not only did you pivot in like what you were anticipating on doing as your career progressed, but you're also pivoting in your actual knowledge within the field. That's pretty incredible. How did that end up going about? How did you get through the hurdle of not knowing civil compared to your traditional mechanical background? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So, you know, there's no substitution to just hunkering down and studying. Mm -hmm. So that's what I did. Um, so, you know, to, to begin with, a lot of engineers get their EIT certification. It's called engineer in training certification mm -hmm. when they are getting their bachelor's degree. Actually, they do it even before they graduate. And me skipping that part because I was in India when I got right. my bachelor's, I did not even know about that exam. It's an eight hour exam. So I, need to, I needed to get that first. And I realized after working in civil engineering for a few years, for a couple of years, I realized that I needed to get my professional engineering license. To be anything in civil engineering, you need to have a license to progress in your career. So when I figured out, oh, I need, I need to take the PE exam, I realized I don't have the EIT, the prerequisite exam. Mm. So this I was trying to get after three years after, out of school. So I had to like hunker down and I just got introduced to peanut butter sandwiches by <laughs> 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 a coworker who was super kind. And I go, oh my God, this is super easy. I don't have to waste time cooking. And I was living by myself. So it was totally fine to just eat peanut butter sandwiches. And that, that's what I did for nine months. I didn't waste time cooking. I would go to work, come back home and study. I prepared way too much for the EIT but I just didn't want to take any chances and I passed it on my first try. And, yeah. and then apply, even applying to sit for the PE is a big production. You know, you need to write an essay and get references from other engineers saying, yes, she's a good engineer. You need to at least let her sit for the exam and try to pass it. Mm -hmm. uh, the PE is also an ADAR exam. So, you know, I just studied it. I know there's a long winded answer to your question, no. but I may have studied for a few thousand hours. That's and, incredible. And, and, you know, I didn't understand many words. I would come across something and I go, what is that? And I open up Google and then try and figure out what it is and then try to calculate it and then try to get like into advanced topics, just understanding, just know I understood what that word means. So there was a lot of that going on. That is absolutely incredible. Yeah, because you had, I'm sure, a pretty decent language barrier at the very beginning when you first came to the U.S., I assume, as much at no, least. No, like no, not really. Not really. So the language of instruction in India is English. Really? Oh, I yeah, didn't even know that. At least, at least in private schools, is English. And uh, I mean, we are taught other languages. So I'm fluent. Uh, I can read and write five different languages. Oh, my um, gosh. But, but everything else like except for the languages everything else it, like math science and social studies they're all the language of instruction is english but we read it and we write it but we don't speak it for the most part right um, but i had an amazing english teacher and um my english it didn't change much actually uh from when i was there to even now no I, at least in my opinion Wow. I mean, that's still incredible. Just like being able to take an entirely new topic of instruction and learning it in a few months and then getting a license and moving on in your career. That's just, I could never imagine myself doing that. It's pretty incredible. It took me years, Abigail. <laughs> Sorry. It, it didn't take months. It took oh, I, you said nine months of studying. So I'm just assuming <laughs> yeah. like nine months. Oh, oh my yeah. gosh. Okay, sorry. Yeah, nine months to get the prerequisite exam. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, was, that was nine months. That was total overkill, nine months for that exam. I would have done it with like half of that. But the PE, I actually failed it the first time. That was the very, the only exam that I ever failed at. Wow. Um, so 
the first I took it the first time that it's at that time it was only administered two times a year and I took it and I failed it I, I didn't make it by a few points and when you don't make it they actually give you a breakdown they go in structural you did okay there I think there are five different aspects of civil engineering where they test you okay. so structural traffic and and geotechnical and a couple of others so they tell you how you did and I was so close I was like oh, I was so close but you know not making it the first time I actually I was not very confident you know I'm trying to teach myself four years of civil engineering yeah you know um I actually was relieved when I found out I didn't make it I was like oh I got I have like my husband was not happy uh, <laughs> <laughs> because I would come home and just prep dinner and just shut myself in a room. We had a spare bedroom. I just shut myself in there and just go at it for three hours or, or so. Over the weekends, it was just like a work day. I would just shut myself and just keep practicing. So he was oh not happy gosh. that I didn't make it. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah. Oh it took my. a couple of years. Yeah, That's still really incredible that you were able to teach yourself an entire profession in a couple <laughs> of years, as opposed to what I'm sure is four to four more years for most. Still such a feat. Right. And, and then you went on, you went on to progress in your field pretty highly as well. Right. Am I correct in saying that? Yes. So, you know, civil engineering is my adopted profession and I got, I passed a PE and I was working in Texas at that time. So I got a license in Texas and um, I got a call from a company in, in Tacoma. By that time, when I was in Texas, I had, I was a supervisor. I had a group of engineers that I was um, responsible for. And I already had a little bit of management experience by then. So I got a call from a company in Tacoma saying, hey, do you want to come work for us? So I go, Sure, there's no harm in it, just checking it out. So I came out here, I'm based out of Seattle and I fell in love with the place. And my husband actually moved blind to Seattle. He's never oh seen Seattle, he, he just moved. And recently I retired as head of engineering. That's the highest seat in engineering, pretty much at least at that company. And yeah, I went to the highest seat that any engineer can and, and I was laid off actually, and oh, wow. decided to go into real estate full time. Wow. Point. Okay. So that's also another pretty intense shift in life and career is switching from, uh, engineering to real estate. What triggered, obviously not being able to progress in your field and then ultimately getting laid off was the trigger point of leaving your original position, but what was the trigger point of wanting to do real estate instead of trying to find another avenue of engineering? Yeah, that's a great question. So we were investing passively. So it was not a really abrupt change in what I was doing because I was doing both parallelly for a few years. In about 2016 timeframe, we were looking for, we were paying way too much in taxes and we were looking for investments too. So I was just looking at different avenues to invest our savings and real estate caught my eye because simply tax savings, you know, yeah. you could, you could make uh, some money and also cut down on your, on your taxes. And that was the main reason for me to be attracted to real estate. And then we almost bought, we were thinking about how do we, how do we invest? What's the best way to invest? Mm -hmm. And we were thinking about buying a single family house and it's a lot of work to manage it if it's just one house. And if it's empty, we have our occupancy is 0% if there's right. empty, but the vacancy is 100%. So we were like, okay, that might not work. And in 2016, when that's when our son, son was born too. So with an infant, it might be difficult, you know, to manage another property. So we were thinking, and we hadn't invested even a single penny. This is all just, we're still thinking through what to do, what the best thing for us to do is. And we looked into a commercial property and we're in Seattle and 
Seattle is where Amazon usually deploys all their tests out. We are in the test bed. So, you know, we're like, it might not be a good idea to, to get into a brick and mortar out here, at least in Seattle. And then I went to a meetup where this gentleman who's a good friend and a mentor now, he was presenting and he had given his two week notice at Microsoft and he had multiple buildings, which are multifamily. And he was presenting and I thought, oh, and he was not syndicating though. Okay. He, he was doing it on his own. And I thought that was very intriguing. And once we came back from the meetup, I started looking into multifamily and I almost bought a four, uh, fourplex in Tacoma. Okay. So, you know, so multifamily, there's economies of scale. And even if there is a little bit of vacancy, you're still not dipping into your bank account to pay the mm -hmm. mortgage. So uh, we both, me and my husband both, both like the concept. We're both engineers. So we thought, okay, the numbers look good. And uh, I'm so glad we didn't make it. We didn't get that fourplex. I would have <laughs> install small multis if I did. And somebody bought it cash outright, like half a million dollars or so. Wow. So how do you compete with that? You know, I'm pretty sure I was told there was 1031 money. You know, they were looking for a place and it's, it has time constraints. So then I was like, okay, then we need, I had a friend who was starting to flip houses. So we loaned her a small amount and she was giving us 9%, but the money came back in a few months, you know? Mm -hmm. So I got introduced to the idea of like hard money lending for flippers. And I go, okay, I need to find something which is a longer time frame mm -hmm. and also a little bit more money, not just like five, 10,000 at a time, because I need to keep looking for people if it's smaller amounts. So that's when I, I just stumbled into syndications and just fell in love with the idea. And yeah, you know, now I'm an active syndicator. Oh my gosh. What an, uh, a wild experience. Uh, you started out just wanting to find some tax shelters that ended up yeah. being an actual syndicator yourself. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, I would not, so we were investing passively and I always okay. knew I wanted to be on the other side, be a general partner. And we couldn't do that because we were in a work visa. And okay. it, uh, it's, it would be a violation of our visa agreement if we did anything other than what we are here in the country for. So we were like, okay, green card, they're very hard to come by. Yeah. And we were in our line, in the line to receive our green card and we were having some visa, visa troubles. So we were like, okay, I knew I could apply for, and I just did not have the motivation to do so. But once we, once my husband had some visa troubles, I was like, okay, this, this might not be worth living here, not knowing if we can put our roots down here or not, you know? So mm -hmm. if we are living in this country, no matter where you're living, you, you at least need to live in peace. You know, if we, if the visa gets rejected, you have a few weeks, I believe to pack up and leave to sell wow. your house, whatever you need to do, just get it done and you need to leave the country. So living with that kind of pressure was like getting to us. So I had a lot of volunteering experience and I, I knew I was an, I am a uh, published author in the engineering circles and engineering trade journals. So I applied for an EB1-1 visa, which is given to people who've received one time like acclaimed award, Nobel Prize or an Oscar or a Pulitzer. Mm -hmm. So so I applied for it. And at that time, whatever I was doing was very niche. And I was only one of the handful of engineers who could actually do what I was doing wow. at that time. So I got a green card for being one of the best civil engineers in the country. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> So that cleared the way for us to be on the other side, to become a general partner. So now that we have a green card, we could, we were not really bound by the visa regulations. So yeah. The layers in your story are just <laughs> building. We are Thompson Multifamily Group. 
We generate passive income for our clients and partners by investing in apartments. Apartments are like giant factories that take in rent checks and create profits that we share with our investors. If you'd like more information about us or how to get into the deal room, please visit our website at thompsonmultifamilygroup.com. Thompson Multifamily Group, an alternative to the stock market. So I just want to recap that experience for just a second. So you came from India with a mechanical engineering trade. You taught yourself civil engineering so well that you were able to use that as a reason in a niche piece of that industry to get your own green card to allow yourself to be a general partner in multifamily syndications. Wild. <laughs> yes. When you put it that way, yes. <laughs> that is insane and massively yeah. impressive. Oh, thank you. You're very kind. Thank okay. You. So now that we're in your, you've been able to be a general partner and you're now seeing both the passive and active sides of multifamily syndications. What are some of the biggest key differences? Why did you guys want to be more active rather than on the passive side? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, I think it was an exit plan too. And I wanted a little bit of freedom of location and freedom of time. And I knew I could not get that if I was a W-2. And okay. also experiencing passive income coming in, we knew that if we could invest enough money into different syndications and diversify, the passive income coming in can cover our expenses. And, you know, if, if all your expenses, if all your bills are paid, you, and if you can keep your expenses under control, you don't really need a W-2 job. Right. Yeah, absolutely. You time freedom and you can do whatever you want with your time. For sure. So my parents still live in India and I want to spend some more time with them and my in-laws live in India. So I have a lot of family there. So I, I wanted look, location freedom. And that was a very, very first reason. And then I realized I have time freedom and financial freedom and everything else that comes with investing in real estate. But I just needed to be in India for a few months, work from India, and also maybe take a couple of weeks couple of weeks vacation in there, but still work. So that was the reason for me to like get into, yeah, initially. Wow. Okay. Awesome. And what is now your main focus or really your role in what you're doing in multifamily syndications? Yeah. So I am an equity partner. So I raise capital and to raise capital, I need to analyze, analyze the deals. So I'm an underwriter and equity partner and investor relations person. And if needed, I actually write the investor reports. Wonderful, for, wow. For the group, not just for my investors, for everybody that's involved um, in that property, all the LPs for that property. Wow, that's great. So you're mainly focused on investor relations and raising capital and doing that piece of the business rather than the true acquisition of a property. What is kind of your strategies? How are you accomplishing that? So for now, I'm very selective about my investors. And at least for now, inadvertently, as I was an LP, I had discussed what we were doing with friends and family. Yeah. And most of my investors are either a family member, a friend that I've known for a couple of years or a word of mouth. Okay, great. So at least, and also when I was, when I had a job, I did not want any of my real estate activities to be out there because I was the sales engineer for the department. I was the face of engineering for mm. the company and I did not want any mixed messages. And yeah, so I could not really say anything as I was when I had a W-2. So that was my way of, and I've just been doing this full time for a little over five months now. So, so my yeah. strategy, you know, I'm, I'm very passionate about financial literacy and literacy in general. I, even on the engineering side, I go out to different schools here, local schools in Tacoma. 
and Tacunga Community College or whoever wants a guest speaker to encourage kids to be in engineering or encourage students in engineering schools right now to stay put because we are having a little bit of a dropout issue in the area because mm -hmm. of the pandemic. So there are not many students getting into engineering and not many students staying that are getting into engineering. So we're trying right. to like get those numbers high. So engineering literacy, literacy in STEM sciences or any kind of literacy and financial literacy to professionals who are actually working and that need help with investments. I'm very passionate about helping them get to their goals, whatever they, they might be. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So you've been able to, so far, you're very new in this and already seeing success, which is incredible. But so far you've tapped mainly your just local network and using your personal experience as a passive investor to be right. the right. biggest draw to people and right. you understanding the other side is probably really enticing to people who are curious as to what the expectations are going to be too so that's that's a good uh, perspective to have I feel like yeah yeah no that was the reason why we started investing as an LP is well actually there were multiple reasons we we needed a we needed a spot to park our money so that was the very first reason right and the second is I wanted to be an LP to experience and when I am investing my own money, I'll have a lot of questions. And I am pretty sure my investors, when I'm a GP, will have similar questions. Mm -hmm. So I'll know what, and I can see where they're coming from too, because I've, I've already been there. Right. And being an LP, that's how I learned. So now I write the investor reports, but I would study the monthly investor reports that come my way when I was an LP. Yeah. I would study it. I was one of those people who would click on the link to go into financials and, and look at the financials. So I just studied and learned. And yeah, that's that's a really good start for anybody who's wanting to become a GP or wanting to find something to place your wealth in. Yeah, for or, sure. Or capital in. Absolutely. Wow. Well, your story... It was just as amazing as I remember it being the first time I heard it. Thank and you. as you know, I mean, this is the Next Level American Dream podcast. Right. So a big piece of kind of the character of what we do with each of our interviews is to have our guests define what the American dream really means to them. And I feel like it's going to be a very unique response from you. So I ask you, as I do everybody else, what does the American dream mean to you? Yeah, no, thank you for that question. So I was actually thinking about it because I did not grow up with an American dream. You know, the American dream to me, I guess it's twofold for mm -hmm. myself, for, for personally, for myself, freedom of time and location and financial freedom is what I, I see and I might get there in a year or two on the other side for for our human family in like everybody, all, all humans and, and in general, in my opinion, whatever I have done so far, it's all been for me to grow from, you know, where I was to where I am here now, but I want to concentrate on the outside, on, on, the, on the greater group in general. And the second, the second fold, of my American dream is to give everyone the knowledge to do what they want to do and what they're good at. Another way of putting it is if all of us do what we like and if all of us have the freedom to do what we like, we'd be much more efficient as a society because, you know, I don't know what the percentage is, but most of us are in jobs that we don't like. Mm -hmm. that we have to do. We don't want to do it, but we have to do it. And in those cases, I'm pretty sure the efficiency goes down. If you're doing something that you love, nobody has to tell you to be good at it. You are good at it. You will be good at it. Right, yeah. So, so you know, if we have, if we are financially literate as a society and have different income streams coming in, then we'll have the freedom to do what we want to do. You know, some people may say, oh, if I have all the money coming in, why would I even have a motivation to do anything? 
Right. Nobody can just like sit and not do anything for more than a few days or a few weeks, depending upon how your schedule has been. Right. Um, yeah. But, you know, at some point you want to do something. But if you do the things that you really want to do, you will excel at it. So we'd be much more efficient as a society in general if all of us did what we really want to do. So that's my American dream is to like just be more efficient as a society and be more financially literate. I like that perspective. I like how you have two versions of it, one for yourself personally and then one for that you would like to promote into uh, the world. I really liked I, cause I hadn't considered what I wanted to promote into the world as part of that definition. And I'm, now I'm going to go think about that for myself. And I love that both of yours kind of very uh, similarly tie into your personal experience being in the United States and as a professional within the country and the industries that you're in, as well as what you're doing now. Both of those things tie heavily into those experiences. So I really like that you're tying your passion and trying to promote that to others. That's beautiful. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So how can people get in contact with you? How can people connect with you if they've really resonated with the message that you've put across today? Yeah, sure. So they can find me on LinkedIn and okay. I have my full name on there. It's Deepa Reddy all one word, D-E-E-P-A-R-E-D-D-Y, and my last name, A-K-U-L-A. And they can find my website. It's Vinside Capital, V-I-N-S-I-D-E, Vinside Capital. And I actually stepped up and inherited a meetup group, which is my educational platform. And they could look it up. It's Accredited Multifamily Investors Network and join it and we'll have monthly i have an expert that comes in and just talks about different things and it's a new group well i inherited it recently so we're starting from ground up and just trying to doing the beginnings of how people can get into real estate so it's if somebody out there wants to know how to get into real estate into a group that's just starting and all these members are relatively new it'll be a good start for them Fantastic. Is that a local uh, meetup or is it a, will it be virtual? So anyone no, will be virtual on zoom. So, okay, so it was a local North, it was a Seattle meetup, but you know, it's on zoom. So anybody can join it. Okay, great. And we'll link all of those things in the descriptions and everything. So people have easy convenience to all of those as well. Perfect. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, Deepa, thank you so much for joining me today. This is an incredible interview, in my opinion, at least. I absolutely love hearing your story. This is my second time getting to listen to it, and I am as amazed and impressed as I was the first time. And I'm very excited that I get to share it with our audience and hopefully beyond. So, Thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity, and it's so good to talk to you again, Abigail. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Next Level American Dream. If you would like to learn more on what we talked about, want to contact the team directly, or are interested in passively investing and becoming a part of our TMG Investor Club, head over to our website at thompsonmultifamilygroup.com. Before you go, please leave a review. Your comments help us create more episodes for you to enjoy.